نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم ما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم صدق الله العظيم One of the greatest scholar in Indo-Pak Mufti Mahmud al-Hassan Sahab Rahimahullah he was the first teacher, one of the first teachers of Darulung in Deoband. And he was the teacher of almost every great scholar there in, in India, including Maulana Shafali Thanwi, Maulana Anwar Shah Kashmiri, Maulana Hussain Ahmed Madani, and you name anyone of the Shafi Sahib, whoever you name, you would find directly or somehow indirectly they're all related to this great teacher who was a Mujahid as well and he fought against British Raj in those days he passed away in 1920 he was imprisoned in Malta in the island Malta for four years and he was with his student Allama Shabir Ahmed Osmani for many for, for those four years and there's a side point on this whereby on one night, just before Ramadan, a few days before Ramadan, Mufti Sahib was crying, like holding his head and then crying. So the student, Lama Shabir Ahmed Usmani, came to him asking, what, what's the trouble? What is making you cry? He said, in my life, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, I never miss my taraweeh. Now Ramadan is approaching and I'm missing, I'm thinking that I will miss it because we are not Hufad, neither you nor I am a Hafiz of Qur'an. Although we know a lot of Qur'an, obviously as a teacher, and perhaps they were not both Qurra of Qur'an, like Hafiz of Qur'an. A student took upon him the responsibility of reciting Qur'an. And in Hanafi school, you cannot read by read, looking at the Mus'haf. So the great Hanaf, those both are the Hanafi scholars. He would spend the day, the student, Shabir Ahmed Usmani, memorizing the juice for the day, for the, for the night, and they would lead in prayer. Obviously for them it was slightly easier because they knew it, but again, a big task to take. So whole Ramadan, he would do one juice a day. I mean, just the sincerity and the connection that people had with Quran. And that is the topic to talk today, inshallah ta'ala. Anyway, he spent four years there. When he came out, he mentioned this. <clears throat> He gathered all the scholars, all the students, and he's around 80 in those days, close to 80. And he gathered all the students from India, from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and they were all together in those days, you know that. And he said, I was thinking over and over again during my imprisonment, and I come to this conclusion that there are two reasons why we are in the state that we are in. The Khilafah is going, Muslims are so weak, Ummah is just, you know, has lost his credibility. In olden days, people had their status, Muslims had their status. Now we've lost all that. It is not just that others or the non-Muslims look down upon us, it's actually even among Muslim. A Muslim looks down upon the other Muslim. Oh, a Muslim? Not too bothered. Not too interested. I'm not cared. I'm not having any, you know, sort of extra feeling, good feeling about this Muslim because I think he's weak somehow. Even if I don't say it, not impressed by the personality for some reason. So everyone looked down upon Muslim today as a whole, as a whole, not talking about individuals, but general, general uh, ideas. Being a Muslim is not a good, um, generally, in the, in, the, in the political arena, in the socio-political realm of the world, it doesn't count as a, as a plus. Whereas this is the plus, this is the only thing that should be counted, yet it is not. So what was the reason? He said the two reasons that I've been thinking and there's nothing more than that, Wallahi. And he mentioned those, so all the scholars were too interested to know. And he said, it is ikhtilaf ummah, the enmity, animosity, the tafarruq, yeah, the split of the hearts and leaving the Quran. Those are the two things, nothing more than that. The Ummah is not united, and the reasons for their disunity is not deep-rooted, it is very superficial.
because they fight on so many petty things that which they shouldn't be fighting over. So they fight, fight over very subtle issues, which is completely ridiculous. Whereas the Ummah, which Rasulullah left behind, was united upon the three main principles. When these three infallibles were there and are there, there will be unity, inshallah ta'ala. This is not him saying, I'm, I'm now taking on board from their, that point. So what are the three infallibles that Ummah can unite upon even today as Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Quran again. We all agree on the infallibility of Quran. There's no doubt about that. Ummah can unite upon Quran. Second, Hadith Mutawatira. Hadith Mutawatira and Mashhura inshallah ta'ala as well. So the Hadith Mutawatira is, is a Hadith which is massively transmitted, recurrently authenticated. So many companions and their students and their students narrated it that there is no shadow of doubt upon the authenticity of this particular hadith. Why? It is impossible and inconceivable that that many number of people would ever unite upon misguidance or a lie against deen or somehow they concoct something or they all forget something. It's impossible. And they all were in the different areas, different places, different times, and they all narrated the same thing with the same wording. These hadiths are called hadith mutawatira. They have the same authority as Quran. Because Quran is related to us as hadith mutawatira. Quran is massively transmitted. And that is the reason why Quran is the most authentic book. Obviously, this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved it. Uh, but Quran obviously is the best form of hadith mutawatir, massively transmitted, not by a few hundreds, thousands of companions. So alhamdulillah, so that likewise of hadith, which is of a certain level, whereby it is inconceivable that that many people would ever unite upon misguidance or upon, you know, concocting a lie against the fabricating, fabricating a lie is impossible. Sorry, lady Okay. Um, if the brothers move this way, so the sisters can inshallah better come inside. So, hadith mutawatira, yeah, hadith mutawatira is a hadith which is transmitted in that form. And finally, the ijma'i ummah, the consensus of the Sahaba, consensus of the scholars of a time, when they all agreeing on something that is very very significant very very important obviously it takes some of the people out of outside of the fold of orthodoxy it does not take people outside of the fold of islam if they don't believe in ijma of ummah but outside of orthodoxy hence you see the people who reject the ijma of sahaba yes the consensus of sahaba and their view are not considered ahl sunnah wal jama'ah uh, they have got a different name, Ahl al-Tashayyur, you can call them, or Shi'an. Uh, and why? Because they are not considered orthodox, they consider heterodox because of their uh, problem with or the understanding, a faulty understanding of the Ijma of Ummah. So these three are the infallibles. Ummah can unite upon these. The trouble is, we don't even know these things, we don't even know these terminologies, we don't even study, and no one even teaches this things, very, very few people, unless you are a proper student of knowledge. The masses don't know these things. And what they are told now, they're told about, they're taught and told the other issues which could be differed upon. So you, you follow this hadith and you follow that hadith and we're fighting on that. You follow this view and you follow that view, fighting on that. This is the, this is the issue. Where the masses, the common people, are fighting over the issues which are not relevant anyway. It is like the hadith of Bani Qurayza. Yeah, when Rasulullah commanded people to go and pray and don't pray except until you are in the vicinity of Qurayza. And they, some prayed and some didn't. And they, they didn't re rebuke each other. They never fought on that. Even more than that is this hadith where, subhanAllah, this man came to Rasulullah and Abu Hurairah who is narrating this hadith. And he asked, Ya Rasulullah, can I kiss my wife while I'm fasting? While I'm fasting, can I kiss my wife? He, he said, no. Few minutes later, some time later, someone else came, asked the same question. He said, "Yes." Abu Hurair said, "I was perplexed. I was, you know, this is strange. Same question, different answers." 
But he was fucky as well, so he continued to thought uh, to to think. He continued with his thoughts. So he thought, why was that? Why? Ah, then he realized the situation is slightly different. The one who was given ijaza, the allowance, permission, was the one who was older, in his late forties or early fifties, and the one who was not given the ijaza or the permission was very young man in his early twenties, late teens. The trouble is, if the, the, the person is fasting and he, the young one would continue to kiss and if he cannot control himself and go beyond that and have a sexual relationship, intercourse, he would then have to fast 60 in a row as a punishment, as the expiation. That would be too much burdensome for him. So that's, that was the reason, as Abu Huraira narrated, Rasul didn't allow this man the other one was old enough to control himself. This is not the first time. This is, he's not in his honeymoon period. Okay? So he is much more in control. So the, can you see a lot of wisdom there? That wisdom, if the first person goes out and say, by the way, I know a hadith of Rasulullah and there's no doubt this is Sahih hadith because I heard it myself. For him, this is the most authentic hadith on the face of earth. Because this is the only hadith, if this is the only hadith he heard. Yet, is he allowed to give fatwa based on that hadith? If he goes out and says, by the way, oh, you, you, you can do it, oh, you can do it. No. Likewise, the other person, because they are both known, non-scholars or non-fuqaha, they shouldn't be doing it. That's why knowing a hadith by a laity, a common man, doesn't make any difference. Whether you know it or you don't, doesn't matter. Because you don't know every single hadith on the issue. Abu Hurairah in this case knew it, so he could decipher what's what was what, and he could understand the, the reason and the wisdom behind a deep answer like this. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, once his, obviously his teaching is very clear on this, where he says, you cannot go to a place where a haram is committed, and you know that you cannot stop it, physically or verbally. If you fear that you can't do it, then it is not allowed for you to go in such places, if there was some haram. And if there's a haram gathering happening somewhere, you know, music and dance and mixed gathering and the alcohol. You're not supposed to be there. This is his fatwa. So he's teaching this. Someone came and asked, Oh, the governor of this city asked me to ask you, there's a fun fair going on, whether he's allowed to go there. He said, Ah, yes, go. And then he continued, One of this one, like, you, know, you just taught us, and your view is that we shouldn't be doing it. So you stopped us from doing it. We, we were not allowed to go there, and now you're allowing this man to go. He said, yes, the fatwa is the same. For him, the reason is, what he is going to do generally, if he's not involved or busy with something else like this, he continues to give you know, verdicts and decisions about get him in the prison, kill him and do that, because he is a tyrant. So, so to save people, from his shir, from his you know, oppression, for that moment of time, four or five hours, I thought it's better that he spend some time in lesser of the two evils. If he is there, evil, yes, but at least other people are saved from his tyranny for that amount of time. And this is deep, this is why, this is not for you and me to understand and to think about, unless you are a serious student of knowledge. Anyway, the idea is, the laity, the common men, they should not busy themselves with these issues. They should leave that to the scholars, and scholars would sort it out, inshallah, in the best possible way. The trouble is that we now are more interested in this than the actual essentials of deen. And third and finally, is ijma, the consensus, which alhamdulillah we understand and agree on, that when ummah is agreed, ummah means the scholars of the ummah, agree on an issue, that issue becomes literally sanctified in such a way that it is very, very authentic and strong. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun What does that mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we have revealed this, this as a reminder and we shall preserve it. When Allah preserve it, it does not just mean the, me, the, the Quran itself as a word but the meaning itself, itself as well as the mufassirun of the ayah would say. So even the meaning or the import, because there's no point Allah preserving the words and then he said, people will just completely, everyone in the ummah 
at the scholarly level, the fuqaha level, they will all be able to mis be misguided or unite upon the misguidance on this particular issue. That is a possibility. If it is a possibility, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't preserved the deen. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfills his promise. Yes? That's part of faith, isn't it? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the deen. And one of the ways is that he would not cause people, as the hadith of Rasulullah would say, there are many hadiths to support this hadith which is slightly weaker in narration. La ummati ala that my ummah would never unite upon misguidance. But everyone, everyone of the scholars on particular issue cannot make a mistake. It is a possibility and it has happened that a group of scholars erred on the issue. Only few might have got it right. Maybe even one or two have got it right. Rest got it wrong is a possibility. Theoretical possibility. But they all agree on that. Now who is going to correct it later on? Say a hundred years later, how would you be able to then correct it if that mistake actually crept into deen? Unless you have revelation. I mean, what is the reason of you knowing the truth now, which they as a group together could not do? There's no other way except, except revelation. Unless you're saying that they did not have that particular ayah of Qur'an available to them or a hadith available to them. But that could go for maybe early part of Islam when hadiths were not all compiled. You can say that theoretically. But again, that, that's a different debate. Uh, we'll leave that for the time being. But how is that a problem going on from 1st to 2nd to 3rd and 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th centuries and 8th and all of a sudden someone decides that actually no, this is what it means. And the, somehow there are many examples coming to mind. I will leave it because that's not the uh, top uh, topic of the talk today. Anyway, Ijma of Ummah consensus, Quran, Hadith Mutawatira, or Hadith Mashura, and Ijma Ummah. These are infallibles, and Ummah can unite upon that. As long as we say that we agree that we would not differ on this, rest, if we differ, we differ with decorum, we differ with etiquettes. You do the way you do it. And I do the way I follow my scholar or imam. You continue with, ev- with whoever you trust. Alhamdulillah, no problem. As long as you don't consider yourself to be upon the truth and everyone else to be a deviant. Why? Because neither your scholar or imam or my scholar nor my imam or scholar get revelation. This is their ijtihad. This is their exertion. They tried their best to arrive at the ruling. So even if my scholar or your imam, one of the two, erred on the issue, which is a possibility, obviously, which is the case, if two issues are different, and th- those two imams say a completely different thing, it cannot be that they both are right. They cannot be both right. This is another common misconception. People say if they're all right, then we can follow whichever. No. What we say when we say that all imams are rightly guided and you can follow any of them, it only means that they are protected in such a way that even if they make, made a mistake, that mistake is not sinful. They are not going to be you know, punished for that mistake. Why? Because Rasulullah said when the Qadi or the Alim or the Mujtahid, you know, the Imam, the Mufti, when they decide on an issue, they exhaust all the avenues, they exert themselves, they come and arrive at a situation, at a ruling, which is right, they get two rewards. If they got it wrong, then they get one reward. It doesn't say they will be punished because they got it wrong. They actually get rewarded for their exertion. It is like two physicians sitting together. They're both qualified. They're both master in this, in this subject, in their specialty. And they both try to diagnose a problem, and they both diagnose differently. Obviously, one is right, one is wrong. But none of that could be penalized in the court of law. Why? Because they are qualified, and they have used their juristic, or their, in this case, medical knowledge based on all the evidences that they had and the experience. So even if one is wrong, it doesn't make, the, make him or anyone you know, uh, liable for any punishment. Yeah, people do make mistakes. This was a mistake, but I followed this you know, proper protocol and the guideline, but I arrived at this rule. I, this was a possibility for that. And I did this way, and I arrived at this ruling. Fine. None of them are blameworthy in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But obviously one is right, one would get one reward, one would get two rewards. That's different. As regards the common men, us, we have clear prescription by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So if you leave it there, 
and do what we think is the best thing and without uh, offending others because they might follow someone that you don't know unless you know that they're clearly not following any legitimate view but they are following their whim or their ignorance or whatever then you can correct them otherwise just leave them because that's not the most important issue of the ummah because the most important issue is the second one which is Quran which is Quran and wallahi this this is the state of the ummah whereby you know people can't even recite Quran You know, just simply, simply cannot even read it, let alone with Tajweed. And with Tajweed, there are people who have been studying for, for literally years. Even then, they cannot master it. Master in such a way that at least they do not make any basic mistakes there. Lahanjali, the common, you know, the grave mistakes. They still make grave mistakes despite studying and doing it for many, many years. And it's not easy. It's a bit of a task. Except that when you do it, you can you so the minute you start thinking, I need to improve my tajweed. I need to learn tajweed, how to recite Quran, and I've I'm going to you know commit myself to hourly session once a day or half an hour, whatever I could do, I'm going to do it regularly. The minute you have that resolve, inshallah ta'ala, you continue to recite on the side you know with whatever level you have, but continue to improve on this side as well you are saved. Even if it takes your life, it doesn't matter. Even if you die in, in doing so, perfectly fine. Because you are striving, you are doing your best, you are trying your best. You might not have enough time to spend half an hour every day, but at least once a week. But if you are not even bothered about that, on the day of judgment, this Quran is going to take you to task. Be hujjatan alayk, as opposed to hujjatan lak. It would argue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either against you or for you. And Rasulullah Sallallahu mentioned about two things, fasting and Qur'an. And Qur'an is going to argue with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, either for people or against them. It's a tough, tough situation. How much are we concerned about you know, people having their Qur'anic recitation done properly? Or myself, my children, my parents, my father dying and he could not recite Qur'an properly? What sort of feeling I have? Not even for this. I've never even thought of getting my stage read improved, which we think is the you know, lowly job that someone is doing. That Imam, I will give, give him five pounds for my child, and I'm not myself bothered about sitting with this Qari who has spent his life with Quran. This is the attitude that the Sheikh, when he mentioned the Ummah is in, in the state that we are in, because as the as the Bal would say, you know, was the Hami Muazziste, Musalma Hoke, or Tum Khaduwe Tariqe Quran Hoke, that is what it means. They were at that level, why? The Sahaba and the pious people of the previous generation because they were proper Muslim and we cannot be proper Muslim unless we fulfill all the rights of Qur'an. It is not just believing in Qur'an to be word of God. That is the first and essential part, obviously, and very important one. But after that is recitation. So, and recitation with siha, with the correct pronunciation. And if you continue to recite in Urdu or in Bangla or in Gujarati or in any other language, you haven't done justice to Quran or Nigerian even. People do that. They're dal and their dals are, they, they just don't know. They cannot pronounce ayin, they're not bothered about that. Their qa and ka are not, you know, different, they're same. People cannot even pronounce, so, so this is one thing where makhari must be corrected. Second thing is prolongation. People do prolong extra. They, they do read it, and no matter what, they continue to prolong something which should not be prolonged, and sometimes at the cost of changing the meaning of the ayah. And it's haram. In Quran, it's haram. Knowing tajweed, this basic makharaj, and knowing the basic rules of mudud, mud, because that can change the meaning, is a must upon every Muslim. Upon every Muslim, this is a must and obligation. We're not bothered. So my ilm starts from I want to know what is in Bukhari. So I've got Bukhari Sahih al Bukhari Fatul Barim, Ibn Kathir, that should be there, Tafsir book. All fantastic stuff. But have I done my basic stuff up to that level? No, I'm not bothered about it. I'm not interested in knowing A, B, C, D, because that's so basic. Kids should do it. And I'm above that. I must do something higher than that. But I can never achieve that if my the students of all these great imams, they, would n they were not allowed to come in the majlis. Imam Muhammad, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, 
he was 14 when he tried to come and, and join the, the halaq of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa. He had like, you know, big halaqas as all the imams had. He said, how old are you? I want to join you. How old are you? 14. Have you memorized Quran? No. Come and uh, once you've memorized it, then come. He went one month, memorized Quran, came back. I memorized it. Fantastic. Now you can join us. That's a different story, very f- amazing story. He's a 14-year-old, and his first question was just so intelligent. You feel, anyway, this, these are imams, these are giant people. Anyway, the bottom line is, if you haven't memorized Quran, most imams would not take you as a student. That's a given thing. It's a basic thing. Knowing Quran is a basic thing by memory. And there are a lot of benefits that you will know. I mean, the, the hadith of Rasulullah, um, you, you just read... A hadith of fadail of Quran is subhanAllah. For one, Rasulullah says, I mean, the hadith. Let, let's just go through a few of them so that we can, you know, get enlightened. Um, Abi Umama radiallahu ta'ala, an Abi Umama radiallahu ta'ala, an, qala samiyatu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yaqul, iqra'u al-Qur'ana fa'innahu ya'ti yawm al-qiyamati shafi'an li is-ashabi. Hadith, uh, Imam Muslim narrated this hadith. Abu Umama Bahli radiallahu ta'ala, an, one of the greatest companions, he said that I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that read Quran, recite Quran, because it would come on the day of judgment as the intercessor for the one who recites it, for the sahib, for the person. Subhanallah. Khairukum man ta'allam al-Qur'ana wa allamahu, famous hadith that everyone knows from Bukhari, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala, narrates this one. He said the best among you is the one who teaches Quran and then uh, who learns Quran and then teaches it who learn Quran himself and then teaches it and you can do two together join the halaqa where tajweed is happening Quran is happening you just go and learn that and come home and teach you gives your wife you in both states and inshallah they can get that level I hope and when you're trying your best and still struggling but you continue to try though then Rasulullah said in the hadith uh, from Bukhari and Muslim both Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha she said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal alladhi yaqra'u al-Qur'ana wa huwa mahirun bi ma'as safarati kiramin barara ma'as safarati safarati kiramin barara wa alladhi yaqra'u al-Qur'ana wa yatata'u fihi wa huwa alayhi shaqun lahu ajran muttafaqun alayhi that the one who recites Qur'an and he is master his, his tongue is very fluid and he can just recite very quickly, easily, he's half it or whatever. Even if he's not half it, but he can recite very easily. He's got mastery on it, inshallah, to a certain level. Then he will be with the angels, the honorable angels, the elite of the elite angels, with Quran, because the way they would recite. And well, the one who recites Quran and he struggles, like he stumbles a lot. He just tries his best, but can't do it because he has to think a lot. And it is a burdensome for him. It's a, you know, he feels bad that I can't recite properly. I've been trying, but I can't do it. What do I do? Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. He said, Lahu ajran. He has double reward. Double the reward. Amazing. I mean, one would rather be in that state. Obviously, reciting the Quran with all, all you know, the necessary rules is, is fantastic. But again, once trying is amazing. And we had this, we used to mock as a, as a child in the madrasa. We used to mock a slightly older uh, student, Khan Sahib, who would just recite with us. And one word, he would spend literally some words. So he would be able to do the simple one, but one difficult one, and he is done for that day. Whole day, he would just do that. For three hours, we're sitting together. And we have done our, you know, the sabak for the day, the, the portion for the day, and the previous, the, you know, from the same uh, Jews, and one from the from back. So we've done all that, everyone. And we're still seeing that he's just stuck with and we used to, you know, stuff as, as a child, like 13, 14, you can imagine we were not aware of what we should be doing. We used to mock him a lot. Because one word, so we, we know that. We just continue to do that. You feel like, subhanAllah, this man, we, we feel that he is crazy or something. He will struggle so much. And when I read this hadith the first time, I was like, subhanAllah, that was the man we didn't know. May Allah bless him, inshallah ta'ala. Anyway, so the, 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 this is the situation with Qur'an. And what, what Shaykh said, which is, alhamdulillah, the hadith says that it's here, I just read, the, read this one as well, from Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and he said, Anna nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, inna Allah yarfa'u bihada al-kitabi aqwaman wa yadaw bihi akhareen. And this is what, you know, Mufti 
he is called Sheikh Al Hind. The Mufti Muhammad Al Hassan Sahib is called Sheikh Al Hind. He said the same thing. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala elevates people by, through this book and then destroy them through the book. Another another group, and this is what happened to Ummah. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala elevated those who were really. I mean, they were the worst of the human being in those days. And yet, when the Quran came to them, this is what Sayyidina Jafar ibn Abi Talib <coughs> said in Ibn Nigas, you know, Ibn Najashi, when he asked, Who are you and what, what happened? Why? What is your religion? And he said, We were this, 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 this. And when we, when Quran came to us through Rasulullah, we became. Duk, 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 duk. And that was the reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated those people. Who people would not even look at. They would not even come and consider Arabia because there was no water, over the water with that thing, but nothing else. Nothing else is a whole desert. They would not consider Arabian Peninsula to be worthy of being attacked even. So there's no point wasting our time. I'll go to you know, Persia or here and there, Syria. And yet, these are the people who then Subhanallah where they were we know. And then يَضَعُوا بِهِ آخرين. And this is what happened to us. We are so down. We are so bad. <coughs> Subhanallah. And a couple more hadith, inshallah. About recitation, we all know the hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, for every letter there is ten reward. And then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I, but I don't say Alif is harf. Alif la mim is harf. I say alif is harf. Wala mun harf. Wa mim mun harf. All three are separate. So if you just say alif la mim, with 30 rewards. Obviously, one, can, one could say, well, are we too bothered about n- number of rewards? No, but these are all the encouragements from Rasulullah. And as a decent student, we should rush to it. Not because the numbers are going to secure our akhirah, but rather. When the master offers you something, you just take it, even if you don't think that you need it, because you don't know, master knows. When Allah offers you something as a reward that is worthy of being taken, rather than thinking, oh, I don't need it, it's a small toy or whatever, no, whatever it is. When master is giving you, that is a slave-master relationship, love, based, inshallah ta'ala. So we, 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 we enjoy that. Obviously, with understanding, it's even better. Knowing it even better, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal he once Allah subhanahu wa taala in the dream saying, "What?" So he asked, "Ya Allah, what is the best action that I could do, a slave could do?" He said, "And what is what is the thing that makes you more happy than anything else?" He said, Allah subhanahu wa taala responded, "Quran, Quran recitation, Quranic recitation." And he said, "Ya Allah." With understanding, without understanding. Allah says, with understanding and without understanding. Means whichever way, do it. Do it. This is my word, just keep going. It's like, you know, because there's understanding, which is very, very important. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be. But sometimes you just get so bogged down that people who actually uh, ask this question and they, they do it, they say, I don't think it's worth because I can't relate to Quran if I don't know exactly what it says. So what I've started doing, I would not even recite the trans uh, the, the Arabic. I would just go by the translation and the and the you know, tafsir of that, which is completely ridiculous, completely wrong idea. This is wrong attitude. The words are first and foremost really. We should recite first and then move on to the translation. And obviously, in that order, translation is extremely important. Knowing Quran and understanding it is the way. And this is not that you should or you shouldn't. You must do it. That's, that's no, there's no exception to this. But again, it should not make a recitation of Quran become you know, insignificant in my life. No. So much so that Imam Abu Hanifa would say that every Muslim ummah, or ummah of this person, every person of this ummah, must recite Quran, that this is the right of Quran that he should recite Quran. This is the right of Quran that he should recite Quran at least twice a year. Twice a year, one in six months minimum. He said, if he doesn't do that, he's sinful. This is the maslak of Imam Hanifa. Imam Malik said, no, 11 times. He must recite Quran at least 11 times. And Ramadan would be, he could do as many as he likes. Minimum 11, means a month. One, one a month, he must finish Quran. One, 
whole of it completion whole completion in one month this is my malik saying it amazing isn't it so i mean what what i'm saying is recitation on its own is very significant with tajweed must be done inshallah ta'ala that's an obligation and then understanding it as much as we could uh and the best way of understanding is when you are with some shiyu who are teaching or doing tafsir of quran that is the best thing available online alhamdulillah if not then use tafsirs read tafsir and find something which is decent and maybe not that extensive but slightly concise in such a way that you can read it and finish it and then maybe go over it a couple of times before you embark on to the detailed one so if you just from beginning start on tafsir ibn kathir or ma'rif al-quran you may find it slightly difficult maybe you start you can start with jalalain for example simpler easy notes or the the, the one of the students you know the student who did it shabir ibn usmani the, the student i was talking about of sheikh he has got a small commentary as well simpler easier one you can do that or whoever i mean there are many you know, arab scholars have written it and you would know inshallah ta'ala but go through it that should be a portion ideally if not daily weekly over the weekend we can spend 10 15 minutes just going through the understanding and meaning and that sort of thing inshallah ta'ala but quranic recitation at least every day some part of it you can decide what you can do we were made to play at least one juz a day yesterday by sheikh salim zurat <laughs> but whatever you can do half a page one page Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith he said shall i tell you or shall i give you something which is better than 10 camels so yes shall i tell you something which is better than 5 camels yes we want that do you want something which is better than 2 camels so yes if you recite 10 so 10 ayah of quran a day that's better than 10 camels if you recite 5 ayah of quran then those are better than 5 camels if you recite 2 ayah of quran then inshallah ta'ala they are better than two camels so minimum nisab minimum then nisab becomes two ayah so at least do two ayah a day and that shouldn't be difficult and uh, as sheikh uh, jalil sahab akhun he was here before ramadan we were listening to his talk yesterday and he he mentioned this he said the easy simple thing you don't even need to you know do it sitting you must be in the state of wudu inshallah ta'ala but You know, when you're getting ready, just stand up, go to the cupboard, open it, two ayah, leave it there. Don't even worry about where to, anywhere, from any part of the Qur'an. Just open it, at least do two, uh, two, two ayahs of Qur'an, from anywhere. At least you, when you are in the habit, you would feel that you want to do more. And put, keep a Qur'an, a copy of Qur'an, in the house, obviously, in your car, in the office table, in the masjid here, in the, wherever you think you would spend your time. Yes, that should be there. The best thing is keep that in your pocket. A small one in your co- in your pocket. Now you have on the phone. So wherever you go here and there 5 minutes talking, sitting, chatting, whichever I've got I'm waiting for someone 2 minutes let's just open it. Do my nisab. But that must be a must for a day. If you haven't done that, make sure that you compensate for for the next day. So if you do it like this inshallah like gradually you would feel that I'm I'm you know in a way connected to Quran. I do it something de- regularly. As Sheikh, Sheikh said, very nice, he said, at least give a missed call to Qur'an by reciting two ayah a day. <laughs> That's a missed call to Qur'an. <laughs> Show your connection with Qur'an. Show your connection to Qur'an by reciting some part of it. Even one ayah, two ayah, whatever you could, inshallah. But that should be you know, a minimum nisab that one, one hopefully would have. And once, once we do that, then the next level is to action, to, to do the action in accordance with those ayah that we've understood through tafsir, through the halaqas, through the reading and the many books written in tafsir and explanation of the same ayah so go and read them, understand that however long it takes and then act upon them by and by there must be some change in my life I'm reading it, now I should practice it and we know the famous saying about Sayyidina Umar he spent 12 years this was Surah Al-Baqarah his son spent 8 years with Surah Al-Baqarah amazing Because they would practice every single thing that there is and then they consider it done, move on. <laughs> Obviously it does not mean that they were not doing everything else, they were still doing but they focus so much 
on understanding and then implementing and practicing every single thing. So attitude should be like this, inshallah ta'ala. And then once we have done that, hopefully, by and by we can بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ لِلْخَيْرِ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفَ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلِ الْمُنْكَرِ We can act upon that. that. We can transmit it to others, even if it's one ayah. At least say that, oh, actually, I just, I'm not giving you any tafsir because I'm not mufassir. I have read it, but I'm still not interested. All I'm interested in telling you is, this is the ayah of Qur'an. If you know it in, in Arabic, fantastic. Then you say, oh, by the way, you know in Nadinical Qasr, the translation is this, just do it. So you've done it. You've done your job of you know, telling someone. Sahaba would see each other every so often, and when they depart, they would say, oh, by the way, hang on a second, let me recite some Qur'an to you. And they would say, well, you know, this, uh, this is the famous one. And the other, whatever, some part of Qur'an. Let's just revive our, our deen, and then someone would recite some part of Qur'an. That was their connection with Qur'an. Because on the Day of Judgment, this Qur'an is going to be our companion. This Qur'an is going to be our companion, even in graveyard. The man would be very, very disturbed by whatever happened, where the angels would come and they ask questions, and they, when they leave, he's like, you know, literally in that awe of what's happening to me, what would happen to me? And it's dark, and he's just completely helpless. And he would see a very beautiful man coming in the grave and say, oh, who you are? I don't know, I don't, don't, I'm your friend, I don't recognize you. He said, I'm Quran that you recited all your life. Now I'm your friend, I'll be with you in this grave so that you don't feel lonely. Amazing. And that only happens when you have kept the company with Quran. If you keep parting with Quran and leaving Quran, abandoning it, there's an ayah of Quran which is very, very, you feel it, subhanAllah. Qadr Rasulu, Ya Rabbi, Inna Qawm Ittakhadu Hadha Al-Qur'ana Mahjura. The Prophet would say, Oh Allah, Ya Rabbi, inna, my people have abandoned Qur'an. They have abandoned Qur'an. This would be the complaint of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this Ummah has done the same. We have done the same. We are more interested in knowing and doing something else than Qur'an. I think everyone is at some level guilty of this crime. Based on this, many scholars then started when you know Mufti Muhammad when he returned, he said, No, it is not not just for scholars, make it known to common people. And then he is the first one who then started re, you know doing the translation of Quran. So he, his translation was the Urdu translation is considered to be literally a masterpiece. That's what he did. And then he just dedicated himself to this Quran. Nothing else. I'm not interested, I'm not teaching anything else. If someone wants to do anything, do on their own. I'm just teacher of Quran. That's it. That is what we need to do. I'm not saying we should not do other things. We're doing inshallah ta'ala Arba'in of Nawawi from next week. All important things. But we cannot remain oblivious and dissociated with Qur'an. Have to move forward with Qur'an. Tajweed, if you haven't done it, I hope that you have done it. There are many avenues in this area where people are teaching. And if you don't know, there are many online teachers. If you feel shy, go there. Whichever way, go and improve it. It's never too late. But if you leave it until you either get a stroke, and there is, subhanAllah, a few years ago, we, I had a student who, who was a doctor, a very old doctor, retired doctor, and he had a stroke. And he would struggle, and he would cry every, in every lesson he would cry at least once. Because he would try, he couldn't pronounce those words. And, and he couldn't even tell me, because he, it's with the stroke sometimes you lose your voice. And so his, you know, his broker is gone. Subhanallah. And he was so, so upset by that. And he would sometimes, you know, indicate. And I would say, is that what you're trying to say? And he would say yes. And what he was always tried to say, would always try to say is that uh, I left it too late. I left it too late. And no matter what, I can't do it. I, I, I would say, don't worry. Keep going. You, you are still, you know, whatever time you have, whatever you, you try. Because he, his tongue was completely tied. And you know him, who I'm talking about, yeah? And he passed away. May Allah help him, may Allah bless him, inshallah ta'ala. You have time, inshallah <laughs> ta'ala. We hope that we have time, but we don't know. Whatever time we have, 
struggle with Quran, make sure that we have a company, a good companionship with Quran. Recitation, every day, that read by and by, at least do those two things and then move on to next. If you think that you don't have time. If you have Alhamdulillah, move forward. Understand as well. You don't have to do it like, you know, on a daily basis, but mean understanding. You can do on a weekly basis, monthly basis. Go to halaqas, there are many scholars teaching here and there, on TV, on not TV, whatever. But try to find out the people who, inshallah, that you know are properly qualified. It's, it's better to, to be that way because one point about tafsir is that people try to explain Qur'an without knowledge. And this is a very dangerous thing. Without, this is literally uh, is killing yourself and you're shooting yourself in your foot and they say you're trying to achieve something with, by doing something which is completely abhorrent in Islam Rasulullah in a hadith he said whoever says something about Quran with his opinion and he doesn't know without knowing it he just says something asab. even in that case he accidentally whatever he said just, just by fluke he, whatever he mentioned was right Actually, it was as, as he said in the Quran. He said something that, oh, this is what it means. And this was exactly the, the right thing. But he didn't study. He didn't know it. He just said it because he thought it was maybe this. فقد صحيح رسول الله صلى الله عليه says, فليتبوى مقعده من النار. Let him take seat in hellfire. How dare he say anything about Quran without proper knowledge. That is part of the reason why scholars get very, you know, even the scholars, they say, no, 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 I'm not doing tafsir of Quran. I'm just narrating what I've learned from the book. You will see many people, they say, it is not just the Quran. It is just, I'm explaining what I've studied from book or from my teacher. I'm just saying it rather than using the word, just being cautious. So that they say, I'm not saying anything from my own, uh, you know, personal opinion. Yes, if you've studied like, subhanAllah. Imam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, and the Sheikh just mentioned yesterday, whenever he make a mention of Qur'an, or the explanation of ayah of Qur'an, he said, I would go to at least, I would consult at least a hundred tafsirs of Qur'an before I say anything about the, about the ayah of Qur'an. Such is the ihtiyat of those people, and who, they are like masters of the, the, the knowledge is subhanAllah great. And where do we stand? We just open the book and Alhamdulillah, I'm the Mufassir of Qur'an. SubhanAllah. Very, very, be very, very careful. So find out who is the qualified person who is doing it in There are people who are master in this subject. There are many. Uh, Mufti Nawadur Rahman does it. Uh, this uh, Abdul Rauf, Mawlana Sheikh Puri Sahab, his stuff is online. It's a very, very good one. So you can, you know who, who, who are the people in Shalatala, whichever you, you think is good for you. But, but invest some time before you embark on the journey, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and then obviously passing it on to others. But th that's it. I, I don't have much to say. This, uh, Abu Ali actually gave very last minute notice and saying that he is off sick and uh, I have to do it. So I thought, inshallah ta'ala, let's just recap on something which we learned yesterday. This is from the Majlis of uh, Sheikh Salim Dhurat from Leicester. There was amazing, there was like 21 khatams of Quran. So what happened? The students who became hafad they did, uh, you know, they did the recitation up to Tabbatida. And they left there, Qulhullah wa Qulhullah bil falak, Qulhullah bin nas, and then connecting with Surah Al-Fatiha and first part of uh, Surah Al-Baqarah. Up to Ulaika ala hudam min rabbim wa ulaika humul muflihun, up to that point. And so they all did that. Five of them, so there were quite a lot of Hafad, I think they all Hafad, or maybe six, six were not, they were Qari. They have done Qira, a four year course of Qira. And these five were Hufag, and they have done their recitation of Quran in one sitting. One sitting of Quran. Which does not mean that they started now and then finished until they finished one last, no. but they had a small break within a day or something, but they had some break for toilets, for sleeping, and for food. So, a bit of rest, let's leaving me a bit of rest. But they were not allowed in that period to look and open the Quran again. So one person, the two person, I think they made more than one mistake or something. One person, two person made one mistake each in whole Quranic recitation. And there was final one who made no, no mistake in whole Quran. And you feel like, subhanAllah, in one sitting. 
sitting here, and they are youth. They are not old people. They started their recitation here, and they end. And I was so amazed. They are all close to an, either 20 or just under 20. Youthful people. They have recited Quran like this. And I said, what are we doing in this? Their day in, day out job is to get connected to Quran in that youthful time when you could see people could do whatever on a Saturday evening. Why are you bothered about this? This is how you nurture, how you generate an environment, how you, you know, keep people thinking about those things. If you give no significance to Quran in the household, obviously people are not going to be connected to it. So now we've taken this, so the, 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 the issue is, oh, don't recite it together, don't... I know there's a scholarly view that it should not be done in, in congregation, but as I said, all four schools, I didn't say it, sorry, all four schools agree on the fact that it is permissible to recite Quran collectively. Even if you don't want to do it, but at least have some, don't call everyone else, but in your own household, can you not gather your children to just go sit there and then recite? My father, mashallah, he, after Fajr, he would take us all to Fajr in the masjid, and we would come back, our sisters and mother would, we were nine brothers and sisters, by the way. In those days, we were eight. So everyone is sitting in dad's room, father's room. The so sisters are already there with their Quranic recitation. And then we would come and we, would, we have to do it. And we're feeling completely like, you know, sleepy or whatever. And you have to do at least a page or whatever. Then my mother would recite something about the etiquettes and adab of the life. So, you know, a page or so. And then you can have your breakfast or you can go to bed, depending on which shift you go to school. To morning or evening and it, it didn't happen one day or two subhanallah I, and that was the first connection that I had from the age of seven with Dean. before they were like careless we didn't know like, everyone is like this my father would not let you even if you say that I slept and he knows that you slept like one o'clock in the evening or at, at night two o'clock doesn't matter you have there's no problem you come for Fajr and you pray and then you go back to bed. No, even if it's your exam, that doesn't matter. Nothing would stop him from taking you to masjid. Now, no matter how cold it is or how bad it is, it doesn't matter. Alhamdulillah, it's not that bad anyway in Karate. But that was the practice that we've been through. And this is a subhanallah. <laughs> and the people used to say that subhanallah, because <laughs> some of us would still try to miss out Dhuhr and Asar prayers, you know, because we do it for, for a <coughs> Because, you know, the, the, the youthful mind would think like that. But at the end, they all, like, you know, my older brother, especially two of them, they were like, subhanAllah, they, they, wouldn't, they were not too keen on, uh, on praying. I said, because this prayer is for my dad. I'm not doing it for the sake of Allah. Because he forced us to do it, there's no point doing it. Uh, but that was in his, like, you know, when he was 14, 15. Now you see here, you see, subhanAllah, there's nothing, you know, I don't think there's any other reason except as a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that practice that, he, that was you know, inculcated in his small mind, in his little heart at that time, through my father, inshallah ta'ala. That now he's part of the Masjid community, he's helping there in America, doing this, and always concerned about, you know, deen. So subhanallah, this is the same man. <laughs> we used to bunk a lot from Masjid, and he would lie, actually, <laughs> very easily. So he, dad is in this Masjid, when we come back, the first question my dad would ask, oh, where's Nadim? <laughs> and he said, so Bhai would say, uh, I went to this masjid. Uh, once we were on that, this masjid because there was blockade here. I said, I was in the masjid. My father caught him and gave him proper, you know, <laughs> spanking. Because we were there this day. And then obviously, this was the first time it got disclosed. We never told him because we knew what the father, my Bhai is doing because he is always sleeping somewhere outside. And he, it was very clear that we should wake him up. And so we would rush back from masjid to wake him up. If you don't, then he is going to give us a proper spanking. Uh, it was all fun, but subhanAllah, this man is a completely different man. And that, that is through du'as of the father, of the mother, and the way they, whatever they knew, they were not scholars. My father was not a scholar. He was a very simple-minded man, very practicing. I've not seen many practicing brothers two, at two different levels. So he is, when it comes to khidmah of people, he would come back from work and go out get your house, which you, you, you may be staying in your house, but you don't have idea about how to get the inner building work done. He would stand up, continue to help you with that for hours, literally. And then, so from dunya point of view, he's helping people like crazy. And we actually would feel, you know, quite uh, left out in, in, in that situation. 
and my mother would have some argument about this. And yet he, his khidmah was amazing, and likewise his deen was amazing. I've not seen him any day missing, Allah knows, Allah alam, missing even his tahajjud, his Qur'an, or his fajr prayer. And long qiyam, and very simple. And he found it very difficult to recite Qur'an with tajweed, but he would continue to try, continue to try. So much so that he was in Saudi Arabia for three years. The Saudi Shia who, who was teaching him Tajweed, he said finally, Ya Fulan, Ya Anwar Sawa, Ya Akhi, Anta Ma'adur. Wallahi, I cannot teach you Tajweed. <laughs> so you are Ma'adur. You, you just forget about that. <laughs> that is fine. That's how simple my father was. Yet, I mean, the, the way they, those people, they nurtured, they didn't know much. Whatever they knew, they just, you know, made sure that everyone knows it and they practice it. So Alhamdulillah, everyone from now on in the family, yeah, well, you know, we all, a little bit, you know, we all pray, alhamdulillah, that, that's the thing I'm trying to say. Because that's what it tried, we all do it. Not to boast, but to tell that how, how you can, you know, run a big family with difficult job and difficult uh, circumstances, alhamdulillah. So may Allah give us tawfiq to understand and think, create an environment in the household, <coughs> learn and get connected to Qur'an with recitation, with understanding, tajweed is a must, and perhaps the first thing, to be honest, if you haven't done that, perhaps you should stop doing so many other things which you are doing. Because, or, or, or you could do both. That's the best thing. That's a nur on the road. So do both. Or just spend time with it. I mean, you have got qaris out here. You have, everyone has imam in their masajid. Uh, you can just get connected. I do tajweed lessons on, uh, on Tuesdays after Isha at RIC, the Islamic Center, 730. And come there, they're all for adults, no kids. <laughs> so you don't feel embarrassed, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallahu khaira, qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sahil muslimin fa astaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafoor al-rahim. Any comments? I don't think there's any, there will be any uh, detailed questions. No, quite no. agreed upon issue, I hope. Was there any <laughs> contention issue? I hope, no, no contention. Yeah, go. Jazakallahu khaira, Allah ta'ala give us the deep, whatever we say, we're going to be obeyed. Anyway, uh, I listened to the Dr. Israel Ramasa and the Moran Isaac is a is a live in the yeah. well, Whatever the Dr. Israel said, the, the Shri and the Quran and whatever it's saying, if I say to somebody else, look at the Dr. Israel and say, but the team completely rejects straight away. He said, Dr. Israel don't know anything. When I go to the Moran Isaac and the Moran Isaac say, he don't know anything. Not only one scholar, every thought of school, they don't believe each other. They, they said, this is our Quran, we know the best, other faith, they don't know anything. So how can we unite you? Very, very important, very important issue. Again, when we say, when we say that we need to unite upon Quran, we, we need to unite upon the Quranic ayat, which are categorical in its meaning as well. What, what do I mean by that? The slight, slight detail there, which is that not all Quranic ayat so there's two things. When we talk about authenticity, there are two things. One is the chain of narration, which is authentic. Obviously, for the Quran, there's no doubt about that. But other thing is the meaning. Is the meaning qat'i or not? We know the transmission of Quran is qat'i. There's no doubt about that. But is the meaning qat'i? Qat'i means decisive or definitive. Would it just mean this one thing or could it mean more than one? For example, many people who support the idea of establishment of Khilafah being the fard, not as the, you know, something we should do is a good thing, but they consider it to be the most important thing in deen, as Dr. Israel would do, as Tahrir would do, and many Jawan Islami would do. They read the ayah and then say, <coughs> Ya Allah, huwa alladhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al haq li yudhirahu ala deen kulli. So, if you know a little bit of Arabic grammar, the liyudhirahu means so that he makes it manifest. He makes it supreme over every other deen. Now, who is this who? Is it Qat'i? Does it say who is this who? Is it Allah? The first person, who alladhi arsala, who alladhi, this who alladhi is Allah. Yes, there's no doubt about that. He is the one. Yeah. Arsala Rasulah, who sent his prophet, Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bil Huda, with the guidance, and Deen Al Haq, yeah, and the true religion. 
لِيُظْهِرَهُ so that he manifests it over other deen. Who 